it is all about technology and social media that has changed parenting. It has its good side and its bad side. For good sides, it make the children more uh, knowledgeable, able to explore things on their own. But on the other hand, it has its negative side, whereby they are exposed to inappropriate content. Uh, they are exposed to cyberbullying. Uh, they are trained in ways that parents cannot even think about, but they have access to all this information. So we got to know that parents need to be more uh, tech savvy to be able to help the children with some of these things. And so uh, um, it was quite an insightful discussion that we had the last time. We are going to continue. We realize that those who were able to join us last time were not able to get into the mental health aspect of it. What, what are the signs for you to know that your child is experiencing mental health problems? And for you as the parent itself, what can you do to prevent that? And when that all happens, what can you do? Uh, we are running a very tight timelines here. So I will not talk much, but uh, those of you who are joining, uh, please do well to mute yourself uh, because that is our basic rule every time we have this session. Uh, we have our usual guests who were able to join us last month, uh, Dr. Johnny Ando Arthur. He is a social and a community psychologist, so you can tell that he's been studying He's a researcher and a practitioner as well. So he's been studying all this thing and will give us his perspective. We also have Dr. He is from Legon, Dr. Atta is Legon. We also have Dr. Edgar Apolo. He's a sociologist from the University of Cape Coast, studying social behavior and all that. So he was also tell us what the changes have been in regards to parenting and all that. Uh, our two other facilitators, Ethel, are you on? Hello, Ethel. And, uh, and Dr. Boyd is also will be running late. So I uh, have Dr. Odame on standby who will join us later. So um, let's, let's get going. Uh, Johnny, let me start with you. My, my, concern, my concern that we want to start with is about peer pressure and peer influence. What, what is happening is that, I've spoken to a lot of parents, is that when the group decides on something, there's so much pressure and your award comes home and that's it. That's what he or she wants to do. And actually, fact, I had one senior person who, 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 who said that he, he was helping the, the, the daughter to make a decision in terms of career. And all that the daughter wanted was a career that was imposed by the group in which she belonged to. That I felt was very confronting for me because I mean as the person somewhere is helping your daughter to make a career. So what is your perspective about peer pressure and influence and what can parents do to avoid or if not avoid to minimize the impact pressure on our children? Dr. Arthur. All right. Thank you, Doc. And good morning to you colleagues. Yes, thank you so much for having me again on this program. Yeah, so uh, on the, your question, the impact of peer pressure. I mean, from a purely developmental perspective, children need to uh, release, okay, you know, with their peers. In fact, peers help children to, you know, explore their identities. Peers somewhat also give children, you know, some validation. And so uh, as parents, we need to be very interested, okay, in the issue of, you know, peer relationship as far as our children are concerned. Uh, however, we must also be very mindful uh, who and who do our children relate with. 
what are some of their behaviors, what are some of the things that they do. Uh, oftentimes, we may have parents who don't care about who their children relate with. And I think that is not so good in the sense that then what you end up doing is that you just give the entire, you know, uh, you know, reason of your child, okay, to the peers. Because the peers actually wield a lot of influence, right? And so for me, I will personally encourage that student, our parents, you know, get interested in knowing who and who their children really relate with in school, outside school, at home, at church, and all that. Uh, of course, there are times where we can see our children, you know, relate with some other friends that we may not be interested in. I've had a case where a child became suicidal because there was this particular friend of hers who to her was so good. The girl really respond to her needs. She finds a certain sense of what belonging with that lady. But the lady, according to parents, was living a certain lifestyle that the parents don't like. And so they were trying to force the, their child to severe all ties with the girl. And the, 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 the daughter wasn't so happy. He was, he wasn't so, she wasn't so happy to the point of, at some point, even her self-harming, right? All because to her, she feels the parents were denying her of, you know, somebody who, through whom she gets, you know, her belonging needs. Uh, so I think that here we can have an open conversation with a child. For instance, why do you think, you know, you won't have to go out with this person? What makes you want to go out with this person? What are some of the things about this person that you want? When you have that open conversation, then we will also be in a position, more or less, to try to let the child know certain things about the person that we feel our child should be very careful about. So I think that we cannot wish away the role of peer pressure in the developmental, you know, uh, uh, growth of our children. However, we must be interested on who and who our children actually relate with, both in school and outside school. So that would be my take on that. Thank you very much uh, for me. So I think that uh, that open conversation about its and its impacts for the child is very is very critical at this stage because it cannot, it might turn out not well. Yes, its influence is strong and we must not lose sight of that fact. Let me hear what Dr. Akuna also has to say. Dr. Akuna, what's your perspective on that? Right, Doc, uh, good morning and good morning to all of you. Uh, peer influence or pressure is part of our social living. It has a positive side and a negative side. A positive side in the sense that if you have very good peers, they can influence their fellows to take the right decision, follow the norms, not engage in any harmful behavior. And even sometimes career expression, you, you get some positive vibes from your peers, uh, probably because they have older siblings who have gone through and they might have been oriented. So there's a positive side. If we use peers very well, they can exert positive influence on their uh, fellows. But the other side is also true that if the peers have certain values, norms that is not in line with the very values that as a parent or as a society we want to impact, then that conflict begins. And this is where you find some of the peers towing the line of their fellows. Uh, there's a scriptural uh, story of a king uh, who consulted with the older generation and they advised him, gave him a good counsel and then later this king went to his peers and they gave a counter counsel. And that resulted in the break of the Northern and the, the Southern Kingdom of Israel. That was a very devastating event. So this is how powerful peer influence can be. Now, now, how do we steer or guide our children to take advantage of positive peer influence? One, we need to know the kind of friends our children are moving with, in school, out of school. Now, one of the perils of parenting is to tell your child that, I don't want to see your friend in this house. Don't bring anybody to this house. That is a dangerous thing. Rather, we need to encourage our children to bring the people they move with home. That provides us with the opportunity to monitor, to observe, to check, and at least assess the kind of 
background, the parents that these friends of our children have. Again, it's even a way of you as a parent to also influence the friends of your child. So one of the things that we need to know them, we need to get interested, we need to ask who is your friend, who is your best friend. I mean, you ask your children, then they will tell, I don't have a best friend. But there is a way to go about it. If they have phones, you can check who has been sending their most messages here and there. But it depends on the kind of rapport we built. If we don't have a good rapport with our children, they will hide a lot of things from them. That's why I said right from day one, we need to establish that communication line, create that ambience where children would be able to confide, come home and tell you, mommy, this happened, daddy, this is what happened. Again, as family, we have our own values that we want our children to live out to. And we shouldn't feel shy, we shouldn't feel a little bit disturbed when we see our children beginning to tilt towards a different angle. Now, anytime we see that, we have opportunity to bring them back in life. We should be patient, we should be tactful, we should find a very tactical way of managing that negative direction it's all through engagement engagement and sometimes listening parents have the tendency to talk without giving room for their children to also talk as if they don't know what they are about they have a lot of things to share so sometimes it's not all the time that you will be in the talk it's also important we give them a hearing now in talking about how we can steer our children, our children away, away from, from negative peer influence, one of them is to encourage our children and help them in their development in terms of self-esteem and their sense of self, who they are. Now, children who tend to appreciate their own values, their sense of being, they have high self-esteem, are more likely to stay away from peer influence because they don't need so much of the peer support and validation to define who they are. But where you have children from homes where they are never appreciated, is always the command, is always the instruction. We never pause to say that, well done, this is good, but I think you can improve. We encourage them, we help them. Then when they have peers who give them the applause, they, 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 they show them signs of encouragement, they will toe their line. So one of the things we have to do as parents is that we have to work with and build our children's sense of self-esteem and sense of self-worth and help them not to always tilt towards validation from peers. Because that can have very powerful and sometimes negative influence. And we should see that as a challenge. It's a face in the life of the young people. I'm saying it especially in the, the, in the, in the teen period, where they are discovering themselves, where they are going to find so many changes happening, where they need answers, they, they, they want feedback. And as a parent, as a male, as a female, uh, parent, we are not there to provide information. For example, if a child is going through the menac, the first cycle of menstruation, for some, they might have had now education because of school fine, but there's a lot of myth around this development. As a parent, if you do not go ahead and preempt all the, mis the misconceptions, around us, then they'll fall back to their peers. And this is where they may feed in with the negative information. The point is that if they get information from their peers and it works for them, then they tend to believe more in their peers than any other sources of information. So one, we need to be abreast and ahead. Ahead in the sense that don't wait till the child gets to that crisis moment before you begin to talk. When the changes start coming, the boys, when you see that their voices start becoming deep, you see this, all the signs of development. Don't wait. Tell them. Let them know that it is normal for any healthy child to get up in the morning, especially meals, and have erection. 
it shows that you are a healthy child, you are developing well. If you don't do that, they are, you know, I wet dreams, for example. There's a lot of information around among peers that if you have it, then there is this is because you've not been having sex. That's why we are having wet dreams. Meanwhile, this is a normal biological process, physiological process of development. And these are the information that we need to put ahead. Let the children know ahead of time so that when it happens, they wouldn't go to their peers, get the information, and somehow this is how, unfortunately, they get misdirected. Wow, that's quite, that's quite informative. Thank you very much, Edgar. I mean, so it all boils down to that conversation, that communication, but what is important is the reason why you are communicating with the child, communicating to build that self-esteem, communicating to build that self-worth and being ahead of that peer, peer group so that you'll be there to provide that information. Then again, and encouraging them to, to, to bring their friends home so that you can be able to assess and know them better. All balls revolves around communication. Well, thank you very much. But you see, uh, Johnny and Edgar, uh, the, the stress of the time, the hustle of the time. How competitive our lives ability. How, how, how do parents balance the two to ensure that everybody is in a good state of well-being in terms of mental health well-being. How do parents balance this work demands and life demands to ensure that there is that healthy well-being in the family? Johnny, let me start with you. All right, thank you, Doc. Yeah, so I think the last time we met, uh, we, we, we emphasized the point that we need to be intentional as, as parents. And when we said that, I think what we meant was that, I mean, you, you, you cannot just... Uh, just, just yes, wake up and say, I'm giving birth to a child, okay, without you being ready to be a parent. Parenting is an active process. Parenting is an active process. It involves caring, it involves loving, it involves guiding, it involves mentoring, it involves nurturing, okay? So, so we, we must have that mindset of what? Raising children who will end up becoming responsible adults, persons who may be responsive to the demands of the environment. And so, much as we also need to go to work to be able to have the tangible benefit of work as in salary, to be able to meet the demands okay, of our children, I think that we need to make create that balance. We must consciously create that balance. I mean, for instance, uh, we know the routines of some of the works that our, our, our colleagues are doing, especially those in the banking sector and the corporate sector. I mean, very regimental routine, right? And therefore, they have actually no time for the children. But at least going to work, Going to work, you can have that mindset of always what driving your children to work. Okay, within that space, within that space from home to dropping a the child, there, there's a lot of conversation you can what you can have with your children, right? If you may not be able to pick your ch children from school, at least you can have an arrangement. But when you come home, it must be a conscious decision to try to engage your children before you you, you sleep, before your children also sleep. So the work. Family balance is very important. And for me, I think parents also need to understand their own mental health and know very well that, you know, too much of everything is bad. You know, when you accumulate stresses, you are indeed compromising your own health. And so they must have that consciousness of living so well, living positively, making time for their own self so they can also you know, translate, okay, that good time with also their children and be able to foster that, you know, uh, relationship with their children. For me, my emphasis as a social community psychology is the issue of relationship. Parents and colleagues, I think that we're having a, an increasing tendency where children are becoming more entitled. We are seeing it all over in our secondary schools, in our primary schools, even in the universities. They're becoming more entitled because parents feel, let me meet the demands of the children without actually ushering the children into some social responsibility, social roles. 
Okay, okay. children have children. their rights, of course, and it is stipulated in all the uh, children charters all over the world. But I think as a people, we must also let children know responsibilities. All right, how do you let children really have this notion of responsibility when you don't engage with them? So first, we must know very well that we are working because of ourselves, because of our children. There's a, an intent for why you work. Your work is what? It's a means to an end. The end is you raising responsible children. The end is you living so well. well. And so when you are doing all this, you need to also what? get help. That is if you are finding it difficult to have the balance. Just so you may, be, you may be able to live well and then have a very cordial relationship. Please, again, it might be an intentional process. Don't let people take care of your children for you. Don't let your children have parents outside you by giving your children to the nannies, to the housemates, and to the teachers. No, they are assistants, but they do not have to have or you know, bear that responsibility of actual parenting. It is your responsibility. And you must be intentional about that. We must be intentional about the parenting job itself. Yes, we can ask people to assist, but you must be intentional. I like your conclusion. Uh, Dr. Kono, what would we like to add? I'll try to <laughs> reduce my comment so that we can get more from our facilitators because we have a tight shadow here. Dr. Kono, what would you add to right. this? Thank you. Doc. I think if I had a question right, how do parents balance yes. their responsibility work, work and, life, yes. and their mental health status? Right. They are working right. life. Okay. Thank you. Good. Good. One of the things that you need to, you need to acknowledge the reality of the challenge that our times are very stressful. In spite of all the gadgets, in spite of all the things that we've accumulated that is supposed to help make work and life easy. Can you imagine those days where our parents were using everything manual? They will walk, they will grind. They, now we have gadgets, blenders, that can make our work so easy. And yet, you see, we are pressed with time. So we need to acknowledge the challenge of time. And it is time that make our parenting very unique and special. We need to create that space. We need to have time. Now, once you have time, then you have to begin to apportion the time. This is the time that I have for work. This is the time I have to concentrate and build and mold and be intentional about engagement with my children. Sometimes we mix everything. And because we mix everything and we've not strategized, we've not put things in place to make sure that my parenting schedules does not conflict or interfere with my normal schedules or work or my schedules, especially those of us who are academics and teachers. You know, your work follows you everywhere. Uh, when you are in the house, the scripts will come. When you are going, you carry almost everything. But we need to block special space where we move away from some of these and concentrate. Again, responsibility sharing. You see, one of the things that bring in burnt out in terms of parenting is when a parent tries to do everything. You have a child who is about six years old. She can start washing socks, little, little items, teach her basic things so that she will begin to be independent and contribute to the household chores. You go to homes where you have SHS, JHS, and parents are struggling doing everything. That is not good. It's not healthy for the survival and maturity of the young ones. Let's help them. Let's engage them. In fact, if you engage them, you see that they, they, they are a delight. But I don't know whether it's over protection or we feel that is the way we can make our children feel we, they, we love them so much. That is detrimental. So let's engage them. Let's groom them. Sometimes it's good to sit back and see how they do things. Let's try them. You know, we have this fear that it wouldn't work. Let's just do it for them. Then before we realize we are intervening. No, let them go through the process. Because there's going to be a time you will not be there for them. Either they will be out of the house or you are no more. You, can't, you, you, you are gone. How would they survive if we've not helped them to be on their own? And as we do that, you notice that we ease, we reduce our own stress. Just as we've been saying that 
Stress is normal, but too much of it, and too much of it because you want to do everything. It is not possible for a parent to do everything. We are parents who are virtually killing themselves for young people who are energetic, who are stronger, who can contribute effectively in supporting the home. It is not healthy. And as you do that, it increases your stress because you've gone to work instead of you to come home and have, other, you come home and the whole place has been messed up. And then you again is now going to put that place in order. Help them. You get up, sweep that. So sharing of responsibility. Let's start early. Your room, this is your tax. That is that. You do that before you go to school. When you come back, we are overemphasizing academics. So the children will go there early in the morning, especially those of you in Accra, where people, children are going to school by 5 a.m. and they are not getting home anytime at Hey. So these are critical moments that parents will have to sit down and what because some children virtually is about school, 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 and remember it's not everything that the school will help your children get to know, develop. So let them support the school with some other domestic areas where children need to grow in. As you do that, definitely. You are helping yourself because then you can also have space to do other developmental issues, personal growth, development uh, activities. Now, if we don't do that, and as I said, if we don't do that, then you are carrying, bearing everything on your own. That's especially homes that you are dealing with single parenting. Remember the traditional support system where an uncle, an auntie, grandparent, in most of our urban centers, we don't have this. So it's the parents and then the children probably alone. That is another challenge altogether. And that is the reason why the kind of network that we have is also key in this moment. A week away, when we're growing up, there were times that we'll be home for holidays, go to an auntie and uncle, we used to do that. And for a period, our parents were free, they can be stressed. So, Parents should find places where at certain periods, at certain times, their children can live home, they can have time for themselves, assess themselves, evaluate themselves, and break away from the shouting and the screaming. And, you know, one of the things we have to avoid, you know, these days, sometimes we tend to stress ourselves out by the screams, by the shouting, that alone gets you so much burnout. So sometimes a little bit, uh, we shouldn't agitate so much because that can even kill you. So I think that we need to acknowledge the challenge. And as we acknowledge that, let's look at our time, create special time for special assignments. And as we do that, we should also make sure that our children begin to assume certain responsibilities that is age-friendly, age-specific, and will not harm or jeopardize their health and their well-being. Thank you very okay. much. In actual fact, you, you preempted my next question, which is about parental burnout, how its consequences and what can be done. You've, you've done a, a, a good introduction on that. And I know that whilst we were talking, and Dr. Tango was also thinking about it. So Dr. Tango, the, 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 maybe you would have to do another, another uh, round of parental burnout, what are some of the things that we do that causes that and what we can do. And the consequences of course, which, which, which we know is the mental health, but what are the consequences are and what we can do to, to help in that situation. Yes. Dr. Adame, if you are there, hang on, I'll be with you shortly. Okay, Dr. Atta, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I think I, I think when I when I get when I go to my undergrad uh, uh, you know, uh, philosophy class, there was this uh, particular uh, statement attributed to this Socrates that the unexamined life is not worth living. The unexamined life is not worth living. I think that we must have okay the 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 consciousness to always examine who we are, our weaknesses, our strengths. Who are you? Who are you? What are your weaknesses? What are the issues that actually put you, trigger some, you know, vulnerabilities in you? All right. So it is important that we understand ourselves. And of course, based on that, we, 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 we 
we do what we think can help us. I've been asking this question, <laughs> you know, how many of us even have, you know, vacations planned, you know, in our, uh, in, in our life, at least for, for, for the year? Do we even have vacations? Do we go on vacation? <laughs> even on weekends, on weekends. I mean, have we, do we even plan that, okay, this weekend, let me just go and sit somewhere, sit at a beach, go on a hiking, just go and sit somewhere and enjoy, you know, uh, maybe some live music. I mean, these are things that are not so costly, but I think that it is something we can do. We can integrate into our life, okay, and, you know, help ourselves. Because the reality of the matter is that the stresses of today are just enormous. It is really, it is really, I mean, endangering the lives of many people. And I think uh, some of you hear me out that, you know, stress accumulates certain, you know, hormones that go to what, to affect our immune system. So the more you accumulate stress, the more you compromise your immune system, the least, the least issue you are, you are breaking down. Okay, but my, my concern, you know, uh, regarding what we are talking about is that, please, and please again, have this mindset that nobody can better take care of your children than yourself. You may have friends, you may have brothers, you may have sisters, you may have relations, please. Nobody can better take care of your child than you yourself. And so when you compromise your health by adopting some unhealthy lifestyle choices and you die early, you have endangered the lives of your children. So for me, the mindset is that for the sake of my children, I need to be guided what I do just so I can maintain my health. Now I am so guided as to even how I drive because in Ghana, you can easily lose your life through driving. I lost a very good friend of mine just last month going to bury the mother. He died on the road, two days to the burial of the mother. He died through road accident with his two nieces. Meanwhile, this is a gentleman who has what, three little kids. Okay, so, so it has become so easy for us to die on our roads. So why can't we be so, you know, careful whilst driving? Why, why can't we take rest? Why can't we just take leave and then just stay home with our children, go somewhere on vacation, just, just create a whole new environment altogether that will take your mind off the daily stresses. These are things that are just <laughs> not costly, but we are not doing it. And rather, we are paying so much money, you know, taking care of some of the you know, repercussions of some of these decisions that we, 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 we engage in. So please, friends and colleagues, let us really put this out there. Parents need to be mindful of the issue of burnout, stress. They are there. Unfortunately, some really reveal, you know, in a, in a daily routine that is so busy. So when you call them, I'm busy. When you call them, I'm engaged. When you go and visit them in the, in the, in the, in the office, you might even sit down for a whole two, two hours. You, they will not even come out and see you. They, 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 they appear to reveal in the, in the idea that, oh, I'm a busy man. I'm a busy woman. I, I don't even have time for funerals. I don't even have time for social engagement. Please, you are killing yourself. And we, we, need, to, we need to say it as it is. You are killing yourself. I mean, we are told that in case of what, uh, oxygen drop, whatever, uh, pressure drop in the, in the airplane, wear your mask first before you wear, you help your friend or your daughter or your child to wear his. So let us take good care of ourselves first. And I think that if we want to give the best to our children, we also need to give the best to ourselves so that we can live longer to be able to take care of them. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Uh, holidays, vacations, and all that, we need to imbibe that as part of our agenda for the year, going on holidays, going on vacations, very simple, simple ones, to be able to avoid this parental stress and stress in the general sense. All right, and my last final question, then we come to children and mental health in itself. Uh, I think that we've mentioned parental burnout strategies to support mental health and well-being. Uh, that is taking care of yourself, uh, asking somebody to assess, going on vacation, little, little things. Be mindful that you need to take your course. So that is the first thing, but uh, we'll finally come to that. I have some questions that we compiled from the last session. So we'll go through some the 
Dr. Damia, are you there? I want to bring Dr. Dami in. Dr. Dami, are you there? You must have dropped it. Okay, so um, uh, Dr. Tata, you are the psychologist here. Children and mental health. What are some of the signs that can tell us that our children are experiencing mental health issues? And what, let's, let's look at the science first before we come to what we can do to help them. Dr. Uh, Dr. Gar, you would have your turn after his that. So Dr. Arthur. Thank you so much, Doc. Uh, so again, anytime I'm, I'm, I'm given a question like this, I want us to first of all, go to the basics. What is mental health? WHO's definition tells us a state of well-being where people are able to, to you know, cope with daily stresses. People are able to, to you know, uh, be fruitful, productive in their environment, in their community, in their families. People are able to meet their aspirations. So, I mean, this basically is the, is the fundament of our mental health. And therefore, when we feel or we experience some challenge in any of these, our inability to cope with the stresses, our, you know, lack of, you know, ability to, to be fruitful, productive, you know, in our community, in our society, in our family, you know, a threat to our aspirations. These are mental health issues. Okay, so for me, when we understand mental health this way, then we will know our children and know very well what has gone wrong. So for me, the key thing is that just know your child and know what you think is atypical, what you think is not usual of your child. This child used to eat so well, now he's not eating the way he used to. This child used to be so active, you know, in this game. No, now he has lost the, 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 the interest to do that. This child used to sleep this, this long and this good. You are no longer seeing that. This child, no, in fact, he needs to relate, talk, he needs to converse. Now he's always what, isolated. I think these are just basic. These are just basic. I mean, we will not be able, you know, as people to just stay in our home and say our child is suffering from depression, bipolar, anxiety, or what have you. But when we see signs that are not too usual of, 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 of our children, then we can maybe help our children or see a professional who then can do, you know, thorough diagnosis and then see really what is happening. So for me, I think that for mental health issues, they are quite a lot. In fact, we are currently experiencing depression among children. It is, it is really on the rise now, depression among children. But oftentimes we ignore it. We ignore it because we are not really <laughs> taking, observing our children so well. We are not really mindful of our children. So we don't even see the signs of depression in our children. How long or how many times do we stay at home? Do we get involved for us to even see these signs? Because we don't have the time, we can't see. These are happening. And because of that, some of them are taken to all sorts of, you know, issues such as what? Self-harming. In fact, just recently, was it yesterday or last two days, I heard a story of a seven-year-old girl. Was it a girl or boy? Who has killed himself or herself? I heard it on air. Just, just two days ago or yesterday. I can't remember. But a seven-year-old. And the question is, why? What? really <laughs> precipitated that i personally have also you know done a study okay on a child or eight year old girl who killed herself the question is that what is precipitating that what is triggering all this in fact for me like i said when we keenly observe our children and we see some of these changes in a typical life pattern of our children it could be a sign we may not be in the position to Ascribe one mental health label or that to the person. Rather, let us take the child to the professional for thorough assessment that we can get a needed help for them. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dami, can you hear me? Unmute yourself and let's see. Dr. Dami, I'm really a co host, so you should be able to. Yes, Dr. Dami, you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Atta. 
I've been able to unmute myself and I want to greet all of us uh, who have joined today's seminar, very interactive and educative, and also our panelists. So the question that you were asking, the science of mental health in children, honestly, I went off, so I don't know um, what Dr. Atta said, but I believe that um, there's a need for us to recognize the science of mental health in children and to provide them support. And um, some of the signs may persist and it can affect the child's daily life. And this will indicate a mental health concern. So as parents or as individuals, sometimes we realize that children may have changes in their mood. Sometimes you see that they are very sad or they are always worrying about issues and about things. And sometimes you realize that uh, the child may be socially withdrawn. The child may avoid activities with his friends or what he previously enjoyed. And most of the time you realize that there is a decline in the child's academic performance. So when you realize that the child's academic performance is going down or he or she lacks interest in learning, it tells you that there's some kind of problem that may be going on. And as a psychologist, most of the time, the children that have been seen that are suffering from mental health issues, they have a lot of physical complaints. Always they are having headaches or stomach pains. Every time they are having headaches, when they go to school, either they're having diarrhea or whatever it is. It's another sign or symptom that the child may be having some kind of mental problems. And there are some children too who may also be having issues of sleep disturbances where the child may not sleep very well or the child may be sleeping too much. Even in the classroom, the child is sleeping or whilst his siblings are all asleep, he is awake. And sometimes to another symptom is you realize that the child has some changes in their appetite. Yes, either he has lost appetite or he's overeating. So these are some of the symptoms. And also sometimes too, since most of them may be in, the, in school and the adolescents realize that when they go to school, they have problems concentrating in the classroom. And some too may be very, very aggressive. The least provocation, they tend to fight. Yes, and excessive worry also. They are always worried. And some may even try to harm themselves. Yeah, because of um, committing suicide about three times. So you are like mental health is really an issue when it comes to childhood. Uh, Oh, boy. Uh, tendencies and there's a need for us as parents we can help uh, our children when we Dr. Dami, if you can retrace your steps a few seconds back we missed the last bit that you just said I think that he's having issues with his connection. Technology, technology. Doctor, are you there? Yes, I, yes I, I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Okay, so Doctor Adam, are you back? Yes, please. My internet went off, so I'm back. But I, so, so what I was saying was, so some of these signs and symptoms. Uh, are things that as parents or as adults we may see on our children. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so Dr. Kono, from the sociological point of view, uh, putting what they have said into perspective, what are the realities on the ground when it comes to our children and mental health issues? Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, the, the, the unfortunate thing is that 
it, it's, it's a social fact. It is something that is very common. But unfortunately, we misdiagnose them. So these children will end up in uh, prayer camps uh, as uh, spiritual issues, and then it has to be given that spiritual ankle. And then uh, you notice that we talked about the child withdrawing, the child resorting to certain behavior, appetite, etc. Now, without the proper uh, guidance, some of these indicators will be misconstrued. One, you may think that the child is trying to be true one because the child is no longer interested in academic activity or doesn't want to go to school. And you say that probably you may even end up spanking and compounding the child's situation. So it's, 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 it's a complex issue that as a society, once again, we need to reckon that you know, some people don't even believe that children go through stress to the point of even becoming depressed. And sometimes when you encourage parents not to go the punitive or the penal approach by dialogue, they think that, oh no, because you could see that the signs are not right. And with punitive approach, the child may even further withdraw and compound the situation. So what we need to do is that once we must reckon that this is also a social fact. Children get depressed, they get stressed out to the point that they begin to even entertain self-doubt. Can I do it? Am I going to get it done? You know, I've seen this very common phenomenon among children. At any point of transition, for example, if they are moving from P6 to S, uh, what do you call it, the next stage of the education, they have worries, they have challenges. They worry, how am I going to do it? What are the concerns? From DSS or the next level to senior high, some get worried so much. And yet as parents, we don't factor these that the children face these crises that we need to help them. And that is where as parents, as part of our parenting measure, we need to go, as I say, let's be ahead of them. Yet your child is going to go into a new school, talk. Probably you have been privileged, you have been there, what happened in some of the secondary schools? If really we've been talking to our children, we can preempt them. So let's reckon that it is not strange or it is not any sign of spiritual uh, attack if your child begins to manifest any of these symptoms. So what can Kadiba do for herself? Can she feed herself? Yeah. And she's put the chain. If any of your children manifest, or a child manifests any of this. It doesn't mean the child is bad. It doesn't mean the child has been possessed. All that it means is that the child needs help. And we need to have the type of help that is tailored, that is structured to the needs of that particular child. We don't have to behave in this one fit all situation because you have three children. One, this is how you treated that child and it worked. It may not work for your own child, the second child, or even the third child. So it calls for customizing the way we relate and the way we mentor, the way we treat the children, especially when we notice some of these uh, crisis situations or symptoms and signs that their mental health state or they are facing a particular challenge or a problem. I think just as we've been stressing that, Parents, parents in our age and in our time, we must open our eyes. We must be where the children are. You don't have to start yeah, I, from the little that I learned. You know, when, when you are, uh, as a parent, you are with your child, especially those who are crawling two, three, and they're on the floor and you stand. There are a lot of things you miss. You are standing, so your gaze, your perspective is quite different. But when you go to the same floor as that toddler is, then you see all the dangerous things lying under the chairs, the carpets, sometimes pins, sometimes sharp objects. So until we get to where our children are and try to be in their situation, we will never appreciate what they are going through currently. And don't ever say that, Oh, we passed that stage, though we know it. In fact, we don't know it at all. We can only appreciate the fact that we were once like them, but the circumstances have changed. The social cultural environment in which our children are growing up this age is quite different. And for that matter, the problems, the challenges that they are facing is also quite different. Children will get uh, more likely to get depressed and stressed in our current age than when we were in our villages as young people. 
what were the template? What were the situation? We didn't have any exposure. Now children are widely exposed. And sometimes with a little deprivation, they complain us and they notice that all is well, not well with me. My mommy doesn't have that. My parents, my other friends have that. When you drop your children from school, look at the number of vehicles. Dr. Akuno, your internet has dropped. We are missing you. Dr. Akuno, if you can hear me, you have completely lost your sound. I think it's completely dropped off. But whilst he was whilst he was talking, uh, Johnny and Dr. Dami, um, he mentioned one thing that I want us to look at in my next question is about stigma. The stigma of mental health issues is what would prevent a parent from seeking for help at the right source or overlook it or sweep it under the carpet as if nothing is happening. From your perspective, how can parents deal with the issue of stigma when it comes to mental health to be able to identify and help their children? Let me start with you, Johnny. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> Uh, the stigma, stigma is really a big issue. Uh, it, it's a societal issue, you know, uh, all over, you know, in our context. I think that mental um, illness is something that we don't even want to mention. Uh, for me, I think it is due to it is due to ignorance. <laughs> it is completely due to ignorance. And so, for me, one of the ways we can actually uh, uh, destigmatize mental illness for me is to, you know, increase public education as we are doing. Let us take this education to them <laughs> in their churches, in their, in their, in their societies, in their workplaces, in their families. So, so, so as, as mental health promoters, I mean, who are in various churches, let us use our, our churches as what, as a platform. Let's talk to our, our pastors. I've been doing it that a lot, you know, to give us one, maybe 30 minutes, let us do some mental health awareness education campaign in our churches. Let us start right from there. In our workplaces, you can also go to some of the workplaces and then design some mental health programs okay, for them. I think we need to increase awareness. We need to increase mental health literacy generally in the society. Just so parents will know that there is nothing wrong about you acknowledging that your child is suffering from some any need. When we talk about mental health issues, please, it's not, it not only about the... The, 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 you know, uh, advanced cases of psych psychosis, bipolar, because of, no. Those on the streets. It's not only about oh. those on the streets. No, 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 no. It's you know, being able those to, on the streets. Yes. yes. You yeah. know, it, it is about your functionality. You not, not being able to function well, well, not being, being able to eat well, not being able to uh, to sleep well, not being able to, uh, to even perform well. Your child is very good, as Doc said, academically, but suddenly your child is just going down. Something is happening. There's nothing we need to let's break mental health, you know, down to the people for them to know that it is just life. Mental health is what is health, it's life. And we need to own it. We need to own up to it and we need to talk about it. And there's nothing taboo about it. Uh-huh. So so maybe one of the things that I I, I did my undergraduate uh, longacy on uh effect of stigma on the uh, self-esteem of former mental health patients. Right, and I could I one of the things that I came across as a possible strategy that can help us to, to reduce stigma is a, 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 this construct called contact hypothesis. Because we don't get involved, you know, in people's lives, we stand somewhere and then we try to, you know, stereotype people. But when we get involved intimately, you know, with people from different backgrounds, get to know of you know the 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 the, the the, 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 their lifestyles, their norms, their values, and all that. We we end up learning a lot from them, and we shared some of these stereotypical, you know, mindsets, you know, or beliefs we have about them. So for me, I think that 
when 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 we even open up our psychiatric units to people to just visit to enter okay it could be one way of really helping society to to you know this stigmatized mental health people should go there they are human beings who are, who are living there and some of these human beings sometimes when you go there there are very people that we know in the society the 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 there are big men there are big women they are all there they all go for mental health you know help so i think that we 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 we, we need to intensify education on this and make it so easy, so easier for people to just assess mental health care. In fact, no, and I think colleagues will also bear me out. When <laughs> you dare go to the typical psychiatric units in Ghana to go and assess mental health, it's like you are just going to a prison. I've been doing some work in at Akka Psychiatry. I think that we need to support some of these, our units, okay, to get the needed help from society because the conditions there will not make anybody even go there to seek help. All right. Then again, government has also come up with this, you know, idea of the institutionalization, where we are now beginning to take mental health units out of the psychiatric centers into our communities, into our normal primary health facilities. I mean, are we even making a lot of noise about that? How many people even know that there is a mental health unit there? How many people know that even at uh, if you're in contact, there's a mental health unit? So we need to also let people know about that. When you go to the mental health, uh, these clinics, these hospitals. You can also assess some of this help there, and it should be easier for anyone at all to assess it. And of course, the issue of confidentiality, <laughs> the issue of confidentiality, some of these mental health issues border some confidentiality. How trustworthy can we be so that people can open up to us about their mental health issues and we can provide them the help and win their confidence, okay, to always come and open up to us? So I think that these are some of the little things we can do, more or less, to help in the stigmatization efforts. Thank you very much, Dr. Akka. Indeed, you did mention about what the society can do to re-stigmatize mental health and mental illness, uh, which is true that you mentioned is true. On a few occasions, I've mentioned here that every facility, hospital, district hospital, regional, have a mental health unit, so you could walk in and seek for help. Of course, what we are doing here is educating the educating the public to to acquire some knowledge on it. Uh, the fact is that me, I'm in my home. I am impacted by stigma, and for that matter, I see that my son is behavior attitude has changed, and it's I don't because of this stigma. I don't even want to think that his mental health. So I'm looking at another source of help, another source of help. So what you are saying is right at the organization and the systemic level, but the parents, what can the parents do? So it was good that you mentioned that uh, some leaders in churches should invite people to come and talk. I personally have been invited to several churches to go and talk about, about mental health and they are excited about it. Others are doing safe, but yes, we are encouraging them to do which is a good thing. So, um, uh, Dr. Dame, what's your take on that? This stigmatizing parental uh, uh, stigma. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Atta and uh, Dr. Johnny too for the insightful contribution. So what I'll add is that uh, we need to create uh, the awareness of mental health. And I appreciate the fact that you've had the opportunity to go to certain churches and certain places to speak on mental health. What I will say is that you see, there's a statement that charity begins at home. So when someone is even exhibiting mental health issues or mental health uh, problems, their family itself, before they even take the person to the hospital or even anywhere, have already stigmatized the illness. Uh -huh. So as a family or as parents, we need to understand that mental illness is not a death sentence. You see, when you go to the psychiatric hospital, of course, people may even stigmatize their place because of the environment and the way the nature, the way things are done there. But I believe that as parents, we need to understand mental health issues, that the fact that your child is having mental health problems, he's going to depression or stress or anxiety, doesn't mean that there's a spiritual uh, orientation or an implication of it. Yes, yeah, so I think that the education needs to go 
on very, very, very well. And the awareness. Yes. And also the fact that sometimes to some people too may not refer cases enough to the appropriate quarters. I don't want to mention any particular profession, but there are some people, when people bring issues to them, they think they can solve all the problems. They would wait when the issues get worse before they refer the case to the professional person. At that point in time, you've already caused a lot of damage to the person. And even at that point in time, the person has even, have even stigmatized himself that as for this problem, there's no way it will go. So I am um, also adding the fact that we need to create the awareness on mental health illnesses and it will really reduce the stigmatization that people have because people are ignorant about mental health issues. Myself as a psychologist, before I entered the profession, I had my own ideas about the stigmatization arena. But when I entered, I was like, no, there's more things that we need to know. Most of the time, even as a psychologist, before anybody, people, when, when you are even asked to be a psychologist, people think you have a mental problem. I remember those days when I was a student, I was doing psychology, people were always saying that, hey, with the movie, yeah, you work with people who are mad. Who are this? Who are that? Who are that? Who are that? So there's that uh, ingrained stigmatization. So I believe that when we create that awareness and there's a lot of education, public education, people would be able to change all those kinds of uh, ideas that they have about mental health issues. All right. Thank you very much. I think that we are, we are doing our best under the circumstance doing this program, asking each and every one of us to share the flyers when it gets to you. Parents ourselves should make the effort, should understand that mental health issues <laughs> is real. If you do not take the right steps for yourself and for your children, the chances of them experiencing it are real. And for that matter, what we know, we need that appropriate knowledge. So we should we should seek every opportunity to to get them. This seminars that we are doing, this is the twenty third one. All of them is on YouTube. All of them is on YouTube. Then when we are about to close, I will share the link of the previous one. All of them is on YouTube. It is up to us as parents to go and acquire some knowledge about it. Google is there to help us when you hear that there is a program on radio, on TV about mental health. You need to avail yourself to acquire. Those are the simple, simple ways of getting that knowledge about it. Uh, at this point, I think that let me read a few comments that we've had today. Then I'll come to uh, the previous questions. Autism, the Autism DA Ghana. Listening is very important in the communication, I suppose, which is very true. Uh, she asked the question, what are some of the recommended strategies to support the mental health and well-being of parents? I think that that has been addressed. Uh, Manke, uh, please, are we going to have the recorded audios? I just responded to that. Uh, Lady Na, taking breaks, vacation, holidays, very essential. It's about intentionality. Rosemary, please mute yourself. I, I, I muted you. I don't know how you got back. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the commonly known triggers of mental health issues in children or young adults in Ghana? I think that uh, light has been shared on that when the conversation was going on. Um, uh, Kobina Force and some children, when they feel numb, sometimes hurt themselves. Self injurious behavior, like uh, cutting themselves subtly with sharp objects to feel alive. They cover these by wearing long sleeves to cover areas they have cut. We could take clues from the clothes that they wear. That is very true, Kobina. Yes, you will find that very hot afternoon, and they are very, they are wearing long, long. Pullovers, often it's pullovers, then they fold it. These are cues, yes, I agree with you. So as parents, you should be mindful of what they wear too as well. Jennifer is giving an advice. 
autism, sometimes the emphasis is on negative mental health and not positive mental health and well-being. I think you were referring to the conversation at the time that you made um, the comments. Lady Na says again, thank you very much. Education is very important. The mindset of our society is very limited. Mental health issues aren't limited to the dirty, naked man or woman walking on the street, chasing people or picking up trash. Yes, that is very true. It is those of us who are neatly dressed, walking up and down. We, we are in the majority, <laughs> actually, we are in the majority. But because of the stigma, we don't even want to talk about it. We don't want to seek for help and it worsens. Uh, Frederick, Gura Samson, a good education. What recommendation will you have if you have a child, a child who is mentally sharp, okay. but, seem, is, but seem to be losing attention in class, fails to write from the board, etc. cetera? Uh, Dr. Dami, please respond to, to this before I go on. Let me read, let me read it again. Okay, Doc. What, what recommendation will you have if you have a child who is mentally sharp but seem to be losing attention in class, fails to write from the board, etc.? Thank you very much, Dr. Atta, for the question. And I want to find out from the one who uh, brought the question up, what does he mean by mentally sharp? Is the child intelligent or what? Because it might I be clear. I, I think I think I think that the child is intelligent. I think so. Okay, so if the child is intelligent and you realize that he has certain learning problems and difficulties or certain strange learning behaviors, it's, it's better to see a psychologist for assessment. Then the child will be assessed. Then uh, based on the assessment, uh, the recommendations will be given on what should be done um, to the child at home and in the classroom. So I believe that uh, the person should let the child, together with the child, see a psychologist for assessment. All right, so there you have it, Frederick. We, we have psychologists here. I think you can private chat with them, uh, take their contacts and do a follow-up on that. Evans, Evans says, please, um, Evans, my child, my child don't like writing and doesn't do her homework. Well, it's not a complete, but I've completed it for you. Um, maybe I'll give you the same suggestion. Private chat with our psychologist here and do the follow-up. Okay, so that's all about it for the comments and questions. Um, um, the last, last seminar, um, somebody asked, um, a mother, to four girls aged between one and six. Uh, kindly throw more light on emotional development as my girls are quite very emotional. Dr. Arthur, did you hear that? Hello, Doc. Did you hear my the question, please? Please come again. Okay, I'm a mother to four girls aged between one and six. Kindly throw more light on emotional development as my girls are quite very emotional. Well, very, very important and interesting question. Yes, uh, the girls are <laughs> very emotional. Well, I think I, what I will do is to first of all explore the context of the girls, you know, uh, living. Are they living with the mom and the father? Are they living with a single mother? Or, I mean, what is happening? You know, as far as their, their peer relationship is concerned, sometimes we can be overly protective of our children. And as a result, the children may try to, to engage in all sorts of uh, mechanisms, more or less, to have their way. Uh, if a child is too emotional, are we saying that the child is too irritable that the least thing, the child is i mean flaring up is the child too neurotic okay so so maybe we, we need to look at it from the fact of the child's own personality 
and the environment within which the child finds uh, him or herself. There are some of the interventions that we can give, even as far as personality issues are concerned. But then again, this must be assessed by a professional. Sometimes to, you know, the child family interaction, that, you know, diet also need to be examined. Okay, what is the rule? What is the, what is the parental style being adopted by the mother? Having four children, obviously, between the age of four, they say one and six, there will be competition. There will be competition. And <laughs> each of the children will try to find out, you know, uh, what he or she can do to be above the other and all that. So it does happen. It does happen. I'm experiencing it with my children. And so some of these things can also, in a way, influence how they will react, okay, to, you know, events around them. So it will be very in, 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 interesting if maybe we, 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 we see whoever is asking the question or the person gets to one of us more or less. So we can explore this very well and then see how we can intervene in the circumstance. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Jacinta, happy Suleiman had raised the hand. Jacinta, unmute um, yourself and ask your question. Hello. 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 Good afternoon. Hello. Yes, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon, Jacinta. Yes, so um, my question, good afternoon. My question has to do with um, a child who, so I'm actually asking on behalf of someone. So this child um, lives with a family member elsewhere and um, the child has been like almost fighting to come and live with the parents. That, that has always been the child's concern. When she's doing something wrong and they ask her, why is she doing that? She says, oh, I want, because I want to go back to my parents. And um, that, that hasn't been granted. So it's making the child behave a certain way in school. She's either packing her things into her bag and taking them to school, or she would go and take her textbooks and tear the papers or the sheets in it like take it off the, the book and all that. Um, I, I want to know what, what advice would you give to the parents? I think one of the parents is on board and is listening. So what, what advice would you give to the parents as to how to go about this child? Because for me, I think that she has already said what she wants. So it is either up to us to do it or not do it. Should we grant her wish? Or should we say, oh, she's just being naughty and she's misbehaving? My question, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacinta. But Dr. Tata, in his submissions earlier on, made something related to that. So I would allow him to respond to it then. Yes. Dr. Adami will talk it up. If it <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a question that really is quite for, uh, for false in the domain of Dr. Adami. But I think that, like I said earlier, uh, I will again be interested in knowing the context. Why is the child not living with the biological parents? Mm. Right? And who are the children living with? right now what is the what is the what the relationship okay of where he's living now you know what children they are also beings having their own values having their own aspirations having their own interests and sometimes they also want to have their way there is a reason this child wants to connect with the biological parents and so if the child is being prevented and is not being made aware why he's living where he's living and why he's not so being allowed to go and live with a biological parent, then obviously you are expecting the child to do more of this as a way of what? Of, you know, uh, demanding what he feels he, he got to have. They cannot be manipulative. Children can be manipulative. Sometimes they engage in behaviors in a way to draw attention to something, in a way to, 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 to fight back. So let us not take them for granted. Let them become active participants in this whole, you know, arrangement. Why are you living with auntie? Why are you living with grandpa? What's the circumstances brought to you? Maybe sometimes it may be too sensitive a matter that you don't want to broach with a child at that age. But notwithstanding, in what way can you maybe I mean nicely involve the child, make the child know why he's here, okay, and why he's not with a biological parent? So I want to believe that a lot more communication like this is important. And please, let's ascribe agency to children. Agency. Children are agents. Children are people who also have the ambition and aspirations. So let us involve them in some of these things. Otherwise, they will have their own way as a, as a form of more defending and fighting back. 
And it can be very disastrous if you don't really take the early step. That is what I thought, that the child was defending in very wrong ways and it will not end well if proper actions are not taken. Dr. Damien, what is your take as a clinical psychologist here? Okay, thank you very much. So um, I will base my opinions from what uh, Dr. Johnny Atta said. In fact, I learned something from the submission this afternoon that uh, irrespective of how someone will take care of your child, it can be like the actual biological parent. So even if you take your child to someone, the parent may do better. So um, first of all, we would need to do a lot of assessment to know why the child is being prevented from the parents. If the parents are alive, why can't they have that kind of interaction with their child? Other than that, you see, the child may even later engage in risky behaviors to draw attention of the parents. I know of a, of a child who was faking sickness to prevent the parent from fighting at home. So anytime he sees that the parents are fighting, then he will try to see if he's sick so that the parents will come together and give him or her, and give him attention. So please, uh, we need to assess the situation and know why the child is not uh, giving the chance to go to the parents and why the parents are also not taking the child. You see, um, last week I was attending to a case. There's this couple, the husband is in Kumasi working, the wife is a nurse in Tamale, and the child is staying with the grandmother at Suedru. The child is always crying because he goes to school, uh, he sees parents bringing their children, they talk about their mother, their father, and the rest. And it, it's affected the child's performance. So I told them that, you see, once in a while, at least, both of you, one is in Kumasi, one is in Tamale, at least within the month, you have to pass by and visit the child. On vacations, you can spend the time together, but even on vacation, it's still with the grandmother. Children need that uh, attachment and that uh, bond. So irrespective of whatever the situation is, we have to assess the situation and know what is preventing both parties on the part of the child and also on the part of the parent, especially why they can't frequently or see the, uh, see the child. Because we, we, we all grew up and we need our parents, even if you've lost a parent, somebody took you as uh, the, the, the child or the mother or the father. So we need to assess the situation because I believe that a lot of factors must be looked into the situation. From what our lady said, she has given us the story, but we need to go further and know why uh, the child is being prevented from seeing their parents and vice versa. All right. Thank you very much, you. Dr. Dami. Uh, I think that uh, Jacinta. Dr. Dami is here, um, Dr. Atatu is here. You can private chat them and take it up from there. Uh, one interesting question here, then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, the issue about Kane. I don't understand why my nine, seven, and two years will not bow when you ask them to do something. But when you pick up a cane, they comply. This is quite... <laughs> uh, let me start with the sociologist. <laughs> In our time, the cane, the cane does magic. But this time, no, 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 no. But some way, somehow, I don't understand why my nine Seven, two years will not budge when you ask them to do something. But when you pick up a cane, they comply. <laughs> Dr. Akono, first, I want you to respond. What, what has changed? What are, because in our times, we are, this time we have been told not to use it. But here it is, somebody needs it to, to get things done for him as a parent. What is, what is wrong? What is happening? Do we, well, thank do you. we or do we not? Uh, it, it's difficult to give uh, a general caveat for all kinds of situations because I always say, uh, from criminological point of view, if we do not tame this, 
if we don't tame or help these children to learn the right values now, the prisons are waiting for them. So there will always be some punitive measure somewhere along the line. So we have to choose between that continuum from childhood to adulthood where, especially in childhood where we can have room to model properly or wait. And when it becomes big and probably they end in this. For, for this particular case, uh, sometimes you see uh, the mere exposure effect. Uh, if children get so much exposed to something or something has been overused, uh, for example, if you've been screaming and you've been shouting all the time, it gets to a point where it, it may not do the, the trick any longer. That is the reason why variation, even the way we use the voice can help children understand the way we want to communicate. Notwithstanding, they are difficult children. And we have to acknowledge that there are children that definitely they can give a lot of help. And parents, if I, if I tell you some of them, uh, some of the cases I've had to handle, it, it's tough for them. So we have to be measured, even if you have to once a while pick the rod and try and tame Dr. Akuno, you need to unmute yourself. I think you've touched. Uh -huh. Also make sure that in, it doesn't become the norm. That the use of punitive uh, functioning doesn't become the norm. Because you see, when children grow used to certain phenomena, they may take it for granted or they may no longer respond positive to that. And in this crisis, in this particular, I call it the crisis moment where there's so much de-emphasis on sanctioning or punishing or using corporal punishment for children. It becomes a little bit obtuse when you hear that parents use cane. But I know a lot of homes uh, have been using cane. Why? This is just a casual study that has been done. If you move around the country, you see people still selling cane. And from time to time, you observe that these canes get finished and they restock. All that it means is that the canes have not left. <laughs> They've not left the system. They are still useful somewhere along the line. We must face it because, as I always say, different parents have different circumstances. Go to the Accra market, you see the number of canes that are being brought in from the hinterlands. And you will notice that, yes, uh, the rod is still active in our, our, our system. Just that, let's be careful. It's not meant to harm. It's meant to instill the kind of discipline that will help these children learn the right norms and the right values. Sometimes it will get to a point where the king may also fail and they will still come back to dialogue. So let's continue to use dialogue and sparingly use the corporal punishment. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Atta, would you like to Pen share your quick opinion? To, doc, permission to. <laughs> permission to fall out, eh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, <laughs> all right. Doc. Permission. Uh, so, permi per so, before you fall out, what are your, what are your last comments overall? Thank you, Doc. I think the major thing I want to highlight is the use of electronic gadgets in the socialization or the training. Sorry, the less is better for children because children need to develop all aspects of their cognition. Uh, we say, if you don't use it, you lose it. Now, the gadgets limit children in their development. They are children who are growing without images, they cannot think. Without images, they cannot concentrate. Without these gadgets, they cannot concentrate. And that is not very healthy. And studies show that even when it comes to language development, the gadgets don't help. Actually, our children Morning. need humans. They need people to engage them. Doc, let me give you one point and I'll end. I had a case recently. This is a mother uh, almost single because the husband is not around. You always hear the child trying to communicate with the mother, but the mother will be on phone talking. And hardly would you hear this mother talking to that one-year-old child who is now learning how to talk. 
and you could hear the child trying to get the worst man and the money. And I called and I said, look, if you don't talk to this child, he will never develop that language skill. When you hear this child making noise, he's not just making noise. He's trying to talk. So what you have to do as a parent is to mention the right word. If it's that, that if you hear that, then you complete so that the child will now mimic and by that extension, develop that language uh, ability. If we don't do that and leave them with gadgets, they will lose their chunk of the ability to develop other sections of their mental, uh, their cognition especially. And that is not very helpful. And that's why now we have a lot of children who cannot concentrate without these gadgets. And uh, mental health people help us. Most of our uh, preschools are using too much of telly. And I think it's not helpful for, 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 for the, uh, the, the, the baby's development. Thank you, Doc. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Akonon. Thank you so much. You're quite helpful with all the perspectives that you've shared. Thank you very much. On behalf of the participants, I know you are quite busy talking about this, so I'll, I'll grant you permission to fall out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you. OK. All right. All the best then. OK, so Dr. Atta, your, your, quick, your quick position on this cane matter, then we can. <laughs> You know, when this question came, I just started laughing <laughs> because I, I've, I've always been very careful, <laughs> you know, to, to articulate on this matter. But, but if uh, a sociologist has eloquently, you know, presented a very fine articulation on this, I think that uh, there's less I can only add. But what I will say is that uh, we, we, we must know by what our children are unique. Even if you have four, five, three children, they are all unique in your own way. So let us get to understand them very well and know what works for them. We cannot use, you know, one size fits all, you know, strategy to discipline them. We need to vary, as Doc said. Now about the issue of the cane, uh, I can boldly state that I am who I am because my single mother actually used the complement of the cane at some point in my life, and it really shaped my life. And as speaking, she was a teacher, and she was a single mother enough, and she, she needed to, she needed to, in fact, train me, shape me with a cane, and help me. But today, today, I will not go and stand anywhere, and in fact, encourage people to just focus solely on a cane as a punitive, you know, measure. But there are instances where I will say that sometimes you need to what? Sparingly use the cane. I, at some point, use the cane. I'll, I'll, in fact, at some point, <laughs> I was all out for, you no, know, let us just take away the cane and all that. Yes, but you see, this is coming from a new, uh, I mean, a, a new philosophy, libertarian philosophy that appears to give children so much rights, but doesn't want to, to teach children responsibilities. And so it's important that when we are taking some of these things from outside the world, we also know very well that we are people who have values. We cannot continue to create the call of children, where children now are controlling parents, where children now can do whatever they like, where children now then become what irresponsible adults. And so when we need to what, combine strategies to, what, to bring the best out of them, I'm all out for it. But as uh, Doc said, we must do it cautiously and know that whenever we are doing it, it is just an act, an act of a child that we seek to, what, to change, modify but not the individual himself or herself. So we, 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 we punish, we can, the, the, the act, we punish the act, but not the individual. When we do it this way, the child will know that you love him, but that, that act is something that is bad, that he has to stop. I mean, it's a way of modifying behavior. And I like, as Doc said, <laughs> the canes are getting so finished in the market when they present them in the market within no time, meaning that it is really serving a purpose. Maybe, what we also need to bear in mind is that it is also into making people, children become too timid. That is if we overly concentrate on the cane because the child is being punished and the child then is supposed to what, act because of the fear of the cane. In this way, then you are not helping a child. The child must what, be exposed to learning why certain things must be done, why certain things must not be done. It might be a part of the value system of the child such that at some point, whether cane or without cane, the child will do the right things. At the end, in our culture, when I see your child, I should see your home. 
They say, show me your home and I show, show me uh, yebisefie and yemisa, yemisesika. When I see a child misbehaving or misbehaving or misbehaving or behaving well, the first one is where is he coming from? I certainly would not want my child to go out there and what and disgrace himself, disgrace me, and also become an irresponsible, you know, adult in the future. So I need to combine strategies. Let us use that eclectic strategy and then do it so well, such that a child will know very well that it is the act that we are not in for, we don't like, but not the fact that we just don't like him. That is why we are killing him. So that would be my comment on that. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atta. <laughs> uh, what the king has done for some of us, uh, uh, we have to confess that uh, it's, done, it's done well for us. And in fact, uh, before this time, I was, I was a teacher. And it is, <laughs> I met one student of mine who I did not recognize. He was in a group leading some youth who had come for revival. And I asked them to thank me. Why? Because he was a true one. And the mother uh, reported him to me, who he is today. So they should thank me for, for that few lashes. So they came this time, yes, uh, we'll take your advice. But the king has done, has done it. The link to the last, the part one of this program. So those of you who missed, uh, you can have a look at it. Uh, what we are doing today, it should be ready. Uh, perhaps tomorrow over the weekend. So those of you who are late, I don't know why you should be late, but you can still have uh, that to look. All that we've done over the years, it's it's on YouTube. So you get one, you find that all others are following. So you have access to all of them. Um, Etel, Etel Obin Trev has just joined us, but uh, we are almost out now. So um, maybe we'll share our last, our last overall comments on what we've done so far, so that we can we can we can call it a day. Let me allow Ethel to 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 do her bit. Then I come to you, Atha and Doctor Dami. So Ethel, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and good afternoon to everybody. Apologies, um, today didn't go as. As, as planned, um, stuck somewhere with a lot of other things also happening, so a bit overwhelmed. But um, I think generally in terms of parenting and just commenting on, on the, the punishment and, and all that, you know, one thing stands out, and I think it's very important we remember or recognize this, that for children and as parents, we have a duty. There's a responsibility. Wait, sorry, I hope you can hear me. So. There's a responsibility and then, and then there's a duty. Now, every child that is born, um, regardless of where they are, should be guided by their parents or by the caregivers. And so if you come, you know, you're born, um, fresh child or fresh baby that has come out, you need to guide them. And for any person, you know, um, we also need to recognize that even for us as adults, if we don't have rules in place, we don't have consequences for actions, anybody will do whatever they want to. And so it's okay to have conversations about parenting and then also about punishments and rewards and all of that. Um, as for the matter of the subject of caning and all that as well, I think that everything in moderation, we need to learn to balance, also recognize the personalities of our children and how we should even you know, go about punishing or even treating them. Each child is an individual. I think that's really important. We need to always recognize that and not to lump every child together and then treat them, you know, um, you know, um, using probably the one, you know, one, a, a particular yardstick for everybody. Everyone is different. There are some that can be reprimanded just by, you know, verbal, you know, um, a caution, you know, just using the verbal side as well. Then of course, there are some that sometimes, whatever reason you might have to maybe give them a little shock. And, and that's what I call it. So the cane becomes like the last resort, but it can also become a shock. So at times, you know, um, when they least expect, you give them a little something just so you can shock them and then get them back. It's like, a, it's like a reset of a sort. And so sometimes we have to, but everything always in moderation. 
Now, when you are also giving out or trying to modify behavior because maybe your child is doing something you don't want them to do, always remember that afterwards, call them, have a conversation, let them know that you still love did it because of this not dealing with the behavior and not the individual if not the child starts reading meanings into why constantly you are yelling at me you are shouting you're hitting me it means you don't love me you don't care about me you know that's when they start having certain reservations about their parents and some can actually grow up with it and have an unforgiving spirit as well and so um i think that it's okay and definitely things have changed we as parents need to learn to be flexible and stop being very rigid in terms of how we're going about parenting in this age things are different we need to constantly learn. There's so much information out there. There's good information out there. So let's continue to read. Let's continue to join such webinars so we get a lot of them also answered. So whether it's your teacher, your parent, your caregiver, whoever it is you are, you know, you're an adult and you have a responsible duty to ensure that at least the next generation is better than, you know, what this one is. So um, I hope I have been able to chip in a little bit. And if there are any questions as well, I'll gladly answer them before I disappear again. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Eta uh, Watten. She says, Great session brought up two boys on four and two, now 14 and 16. I appreciate these real issues. Sadly, I know a medical neurosurgeon who thinks these issues are spiritual. Education in our churches is critical. Other in the medical space, Others in the medical space also think people with mental illness are attention seekers. Well, I mean, from our conversation here, you can tell what the real issue is that people have inadequate knowledge and have negative attitudes towards, towards mental health and mental illness. And when they listen to programs like this, I guess that their perspective would change. Um, we are, we've, we've run out of time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me, let me, let uh, Dr. Dami, are you there? Your final words, yeah. then Dr. Dr. Yeah. Tata, then we can. Yeah, I'm there. So, um, uh, what, I want, what I would say is that uh, as parents, we need to make time for ourselves, our family, especially our children. And also the issue of the caning, I believe that uh, we need to punish our children with love. Yes, and some people, even in, with the cane, they'll be using all kinds of words on the child, which may even affect the child's self-esteem. So I want to say that um, we should punish children with love. And as we've all discussed, we should punish their behavior, not the personality. And in this case, let the child know why you are punishing him or her. And afterwards, please, call the child and show the child love. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dami. Dr. Atha. Hello, Doc. Yes, your final, your final words, please. All right, Doc, thank you so much for the opportunity giving us to have the discussion. But let me say that, uh, I mean, parenting as a process, is a complex process. It's very complex. And of course, so we need to, what, to read more about it. We need to learn more about it to enrich our parenting. Again, in our contemporary world, that is in this 21st century, parenting is also a sensitive issue because now we have pro-children policies, conventions, regulations, laws that actually guide how we should what, even deal with our, our children. So it's important that we know really what we've got to do so that we don't, fall, uh, we don't, we don't violate you know, the, the, the laws about you know, parent again. It's also important that in this 21st century, internet digital space has become very important. In fact, in some countries in the OECDs, you know, they have actually made internet access a fundamental human right. Meaning that as parents, we cannot deny our children, okay, this access to the, the digital space. They can learn a lot from there. But let us know when we introduce them to these places and also let us supervise them when we get uh, we, we introduce them there. I will at any point in time say that please, there is no need introducing your child to the critical space between zero to five, uh, zero to two years. There's no need. 
Because at that point in time, the child needs to enrich that what interaction, enrich that physical space, you know, around him or her to learn, to build a language, to build a social skill, to build his emotions, to build, you know, it's like everything. So that space is very important that we let the child grow, you know, and build trust where the relationship with people are around. Then that can be a foundation for him to build on and get into the, the digital space. So please. It's very important, and much as we are introducing them there, let us do it at the right time, and let us also monitor them and ensure that they are actually getting the right content. Thank you very much, Dr. Arthur, for your last final words. Indeed, parenting is complex. It has a whole lot of issues <laughs> in there, and the times have changed. It is parenting itself has not changed. It is the strategies that have changed and our times are complex because we have multi, multi tasks to do within this short time. However, the underlying fact is that as parents, we need to communicate well with our children and we also need to listen well. Whatever we need to achieve when it comes to parenting is all about communicating and listening and listening, we need to treat them with love. We need, we are, they have to be our friends. They have to be our friends. But we, again, we also need to be fair. We draw the line when it becomes necessary. With the issue, with the issue about Cain, the experts are saying with moderation and with love, do punish with love, how you can do that as a parent. There are whole other issues with parents. There are whole other issues that I can't even summarize all of them. Because our time has right. But I uh, thank you, our uh, wonderful participants, for joining us today. You made it worthy. Uh, our facilitators, Johnny, Dr. Dami, Edgar, Etel, Amabuedu. Thank you all so, so much for, for making this topic a bit lighter and clearer for all of us. At least we now know that there are, there are ways that we could we could deal with this thing. We could deal, we need to communicate and listen. And that's how we can solve the problems in there. On that note, I would say thank you very much, you all for joining. Uh, God willing, same time next month, we'll have another interesting topic to discuss and uh, enjoy your holiday. For those of us in Ghana here, enjoy your holiday and have a fruitful and exciting weekend. Thank you all. The meeting has ended. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. As a, before, I think you just joined. I said it will be on YouTube. I've shared the link here. There are others that you can have a look. What we did today would be on YouTube. Maybe tomorrow, just type in the title of today's seminar. You'll see it's there.